Good morning. We want to welcome you this morning to St. Paul's Community Christian Church, and we hope that you are joining us uh, online. And um, we just thank you for tuning in, and we want, to, uh, we want to pray, and we want to worship the Lord. We remember Easter and what Jesus did for us, and we, we come to celebrate that this morning. Uh, join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come and we ask that you would fill our hearts. Lord, fill our hearts with the knowledge and truth and, and your very presence. God, in this time of unknown and fear and, uh, Lord, just change, we ask, God, that you would help us to, to have our security in you. And, Lord, we thank you for the power of the resurrection. We thank you, Jesus, that you conquered death and hell and the grave. And you are in control of our lives and in our world. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm excited this morning to have a few members uh, of the worship team with us who are social distancing and staying away from each other. Um, and uh, we're going to introduce a new song. We had been working on this way before Easter, and uh, so we're, we're going to uh, uh, we're, we're gonna start with it this morning. It's Because He Lives, Amen, and it celebrates, celebrates the resurrection of Jesus.
Thank you that you walk on the waters, Lord. 
we thank you that you speak to the sea. Lord, we thank you that this pandemic has not caught you by surprise. And Lord, we pray that you would just speak peace and speak healing to each one, Lord, that, uh, that gathers this morning and, and comes to you in prayer. God, we ask that you would help us as a nation, Lord, to, to be wise and to, uh, Lord, be careful. Father, we ask that you would lead us and direct us. And Lord, as your people, we ask that we would have the Prince of Peace reign and rule in our heart. Lord, that you would give us hope. You would give us strength each day. Lord, you would protect us. We thank you that you have that power. And Lord, we pray for those who are at home and, and uh, are unable to get out. God, we ask that you would, be, that you would be their friend. You would be their comforter. Lord, we ask that you would just show your grace in just a, a beautiful and wonderful way. Because, Lord, we thank you where the challenge is great. Your power is even greater. Lord God, we pray for our church. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to use us and bless us and speak to us and even build your church in the, in the midst of what's going on, Father. And we thank you for these things. And we ask that your spirit would lead each one of us. And, Lord, lead us as we listen to this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, your sinner come to you. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Joy for the morning of the 
to the Lord just as you are. He already knows what's going on in your life and he wants to have you back. Come as you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning our scripture reading is from Romans chapter 3. Verses 9 through 20. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one, not even one, who, does, who is righteous. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. You know, we have all kinds of things in common. But I want to look at one specifically, and Paul brings this up today. Paul is addressing what might be the most important thing that we all have in common this morning. And that is we all alike are under sin. We all alike are under sin. You know, this is often the part we miss, and so we just try harder. And that doesn't get us anywhere. And this is actually the first step in coming to salvation. We need to realize that we're lost. Sometimes the gospel message, the first part of it is we have to have people find that they're lost before they can realize that they need to be saved, that they need to be found. And so the first step is coming is realizing that we're lost and that we need Jesus. And it's only with this realization that Easter and the whole life of Christ and his crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection makes any sense. It's because we're lost that Jesus came. There's two things that drive the crucifixion and the resurrection. Number one is the fact that God loves us incredibly. And he wants a relationship with us. Number two is the fact that we are sinful and God is holy. And there's a barrier. So that's why we have, that's, that's where we need to start. We need to realize that we need Jesus. And that he died for our specific sin. I had a professor one time that he said, you know, he had, he had friends and he would try to tell them about the gospel message and he said he had a hard time getting them to agree 
that they were sinners. Now, my thought is, I don't know who you hang out with, but most of the people who I've always hung out with realize that, yeah, I've, I have sinned. I have sinned. But Paul brings that to the forefront this morning. He says, we all alike are under sin. Um, no one is righteous. <clears throat> then he says, not even one. There's no one who's righteous. No one at all. No one who understands. No one who really understands. We understand from a human standpoint. But we don't have the full depth of understanding. No one who seeks God. You know, God seeks us before we even seek him. When I found the Lord Jesus Christ, I wasn't looking for him. I wasn't looking for him at all. And I think most of us, if you think about your story, you may have been looking for anything else, but you weren't really seeking God until maybe life brought you to a place and God was kind of setting you up. It says, all have turned away from God, become worthless, and there's no one who does good. So there's no one who is righteous, no one who understands, no one who seeks God, and no one who does good, not even one. And we're going to get more specific here. Um, and you know, every once in a while I've heard people say, well, you know, I was always a really good person, even before I accepted Christ. And that always makes me wonder, you know. Now, I think we can say, you know what, I was raised right. I knew how to treat people. But ultimately, underneath all of it, we're under sin. We don't have to try very hard to sin. It comes very natural. We have a sinful nature. And you know, specifically, as we look through these things, I'm going to ask you, don't focus so much on others. Paul says they, but this is also speaking to ourselves. Focus on your own life and situations. So some specifics here. Number one, words. Words, number one. He says their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. You know, have you ever heard this, the saying, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you? I don't know who come up with that. The Bible says that words sink deep down into our soul. Every one of us has sinned with our words. And the illustrations here bring death. Words can bring death. It says open graves, the poison of vipers. So we come before God and we are guilty when it comes to our words. And this isn't talking about just saying the wrong thing. It includes that. But in our words, we say things that dishonor God. Number two is our actions. It says their feet are swift to shed blood in verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. You know, we are so quick to do things that are destructive. And I know you might be saying, well, I, you know, I don't want to kill anybody. I mean, even, even before Christ, I wasn't running to people and wanting to shed blood. But we may have had hatred in our heart. We may have had actions that we just didn't care about other people. You know, what's in it for me? Our primary intent is to get out of it what we want out of it in our own selfishness. And sometimes, to be honest, we just don't even look at what other people 
are going through because of our choices and our actions. You know, people climb their way to the top and step on anybody that they can. Or maybe revenge is a thing, the actions of, okay, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. There's lots of actions, things that we do that don't honor God, that show us as guilty as sinners. So our words make us guilty. Our actions make us guilty as sinners. <clears throat> and number three, our lifestyles. Our lifestyles. It, it contrasts the way of misery and ruin and the way of peace. So the ways, our ways, our lifestyles. And so there's two kinds of lifestyles. There's the, the way of ruin and misery from the sinful nature, and then there's the way of peace. And it says, they do not know the way of peace. And I think we've all got into habits and lifestyles <clears throat> where we sort of push God out in one way or the other. You know, you do an action a couple times, and you reap a habit. When you continue the habit, it becomes really natural. And after a while... It's no longer just a habit. It becomes a lifestyle. That lifestyle eventually affects our character and our personality. Again, that's why we need Jesus. Because after a while, we don't even think about it. It becomes so automatic. And, you know, this morning I want to ask you a couple things. How many things have we ruined for ourselves? How many things have we ruined for ourselves? How many relationships have we ruined by our habits? Essentially, how many messes have we made of things? How much misery and pain and suffering have we brought on ourselves and on those around us? And you know, this morning... I'm, I'm kind of thankful that I am preaching to the camera, so I don't know who's listening. God knows you're listening, though. And you know your messes, and I know my messes. And we do things, and we think, you know, I figured out a way. But I didn't think it was going to end up like this. And then how much of our own peace have we shattered? The way of peace... Many times we have anything but peace because of our lifestyles and our choices. And so, not only are we guilty and under sin in our words and in our actions, it's in the very lifestyles that we lead. And then, finally, number four, in our respect. In our respect, our reverence. You know, without the Lord, we don't have a sense of respect. As we look here, it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. The Old Testament says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, loss of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the erosion of our respect. <clears throat> If we don't fear God, there's no foundation even to see people as equal. If we don't respect God and what he says, when we think we're smarter than God, we can figure it out, and we disrespect God, we are going to disrespect people that don't help our cause. Respect always begins with God. Because we know that he's our judge. We know that we're answerable to him. We know that he sees us. Ultimately, we cannot show people to respect to people consistently unless we have a sense of reverence for God. So, we are under sin as evidenced in our words, in our actions, in our lifestyles, and in our sense of respect or lack of respect. 
A couple conclusions here. <clears throat> Number one, on our own, we can never do enough good to be righteous. On our own, we can never do enough good to be righteous. It says in verse 20, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Now, he's talking about the Old Testament law, but in a general sense, he's talking about doing enough good things because God is completely holy. So we can never do enough good to be righteous, to be ultimately righteous in God's sight. And number two, even our best efforts show just how much we need Jesus. It says that through the law we could become conscious of our sins. Have you ever really, really tried to serve God, maybe on your own efforts? I know I did as a, as a young Christian, and, and sometimes since then. Tried to do something for the Lord, and I thought, you know, I wanted to do it for the Lord, but it didn't work out so well. Because it wasn't done by the Spirit. And so through the law, we become conscious of our sin. It shows that we fall short. So this morning, I want us to see how much we fall short, how desperate we are for one reason, for one reason. And we'll pick up on this next week. This is the negative part this week. Next week, we'll talk about the positive part. But I want us to see how much we need Jesus. That it doesn't matter if you were born coming to church. It doesn't matter if you have a relative that's a pastor. It doesn't matter if you know things about the Bible. It matters that you have taken the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord. Because without him, we're hopeless and we're hopelessly lost. And I want to give you the opportunity this morning, if you say, okay, I realize that I'm hopeless, hopelessly lost, now what? We'll talk about it next week, but I don't want to make you wait till then. Jesus says that if we receive him, as many as believed him, those who received him, they, be, they have the right to become children of God. And so receiving Jesus, and then we get his righteousness, not ours. And I don't know about you, but when I stand before God, I would much rather have the righteousness of Christ than my own righteousness. And so we can pray and we can say, Lord, forgive me, change me. I believe by faith that you'll make me righteous because of his resurrection and his crucifixion. So follow me in this prayer if you're not sure Lord Jesus, I come to you and I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I'm, I'm guilty. But I also acknowledge, Lord, that I, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to make me holy in your sight. I want you to make me righteous. And Lord, I want a relationship with you. And I yield my life to you so that you can work on making me righteous instead of me working on it. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> and whether you have just heard about Jesus for the first time or, you know, sometimes we backslide. Maybe with all the things that have gone on, you've kind of pushed God to the side. It's easy to let that happen. But Jesus welcomes you back. And as we close in the, with a closing song, come as you are. That's how God wants you, just as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up first. You come just as you are. And you know, if you're watching this this morning in your pajamas, that's okay. He wants you just as you are. You didn't have to dress up for it. Um, we don't have to clean up for it. Jesus wants you just as you are. But we have a choice. We have to surrender to him. So just tell him that you want him as we close with just as you are. Father, we thank you.
for your love and your grace and your mercy and your life-changing power. In Jesus' name, amen.